It even works in Europe, where they put the month fur or the second. And it's been 909 years since that happened before. Yeah. Learn all kinds of things when you come to church. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? If you were living in Nigeria today, where over a thousand Christians were killed in 2019 simply for being a Christian, would you be looked at with suspicion? If Christianity were outlawed as it is in parts of China, would your behavior threaten to brand you an outlaw? Or, apropos our scripture from Matthew this morning, if someone were to read these Beatitudes up against your life, would they see a correlation? Do our lives demonstrate that we are already living the kingdom of God? Jesus said any number of times, the kingdom is in the midst of you. Does our living reflect that truth? These Beatitudes are a description of what Christians are meant to be. They are the marks of, by which citizens of the kingdom would be identified, each of us, all of us. Now rather than trying to cover the waterfront this morning, I'm going to focus on just one, in part because it may well be the most difficult. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Edward Schweitzer, who is a professor of New Testament theology at the University of Zurich, said this. He said, God's forgiveness is not decoration, but for use. And that kind of sums up the Beatitudes in a nutshell. God's forgiveness is not for decoration, but for use. It is the merciful who will receive mercy. There is this insistent demand throughout the whole of the New Testament to put our own forgiveness into practice as we forgive others. We pray every single Sunday, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It is not, I think, just a coincidence that what we now call the Lord's Prayer, along with these Beatitudes, are all part of this Sermon on the Mount. You and I are forgiven to be forgiven. The same truth is underlined in Jesus' parable of that unjust servant who built his master out of a major piece of money. He's been unfaithful to his trust. He deserves to be severely punished. But he pleads for himself and his family, begs that he not, they not be sold as slaves. He promises, I will repay the debt in full, no matter how long it takes me. But the master's heart is touched with mercy. And he forgives the entire amount. Minutes later, this forgiven servant approaches a fellow worker, owes him some nickels and dimes. Pay up right now. Just give me a little more time. I promise I will pay you back. Please, just a few more days. Instead of giving him a few more days, the servant has his poor fellow thrown into jail. Ah, this ticks off his fellow servants, and they make sure the master hears about him. And he, in turn, distraught by this forgiven man's behavior, rescinds his forgiveness and orders him to receive the exact same punishment that he had meted out to his fellow servant. And then Jesus adds these words, hard words. This is how my Heavenly Father will treat you, every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The writer of the letter James, in that very practical treatise on Christian living, drives home the same point. He says, for judgment will be without mercy to anyone who shows no mercy. It is, according to Jesus, one of the marks of Christian living. Blessed, happy are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. So what does it mean for us today? 
to be merciful. It's deeper than sending a sympathy card. More than simply feeling sorry for someone. Feeling sorry leaves one relatively free from the hurt or the loss or the problem involved. We can say it and then walk away from it. Feeling sorry is surface level involvement that enabled us to avoid really feeling the hurt of another. It insulates us from hearing their burdens and feeling their pain and sharing their heartaches. Jesus is talking about daring to authentically identify with the other. Like that old Sioux Indian's prayer, O oh Great Spirit, help me never to judge another until I have walked in his moccasins. That's hard work. It may help us if we get back to the original meaning of the word sympathy, which is to suffer with, to see things with the other person's eyes, to be faced with the problems the other is living with, to feel as she feels, thinks as she thinks, hurts as she hurts. Now you may be saying to yourself, but no one can really do that. It's impossible to put yourself into the other person's position, physically, emotionally, impossible. So I try. And that's a perfect rationale for us to maintain the safe boundary. But I'm convinced that all of us have the ability to be much more merciful, much more caring, much more concerned than we presently are. Two important things to consider as we ponder our response. First, is to consider how being the type of person Jesus asks us to be will affect our relationships with others. It will certainly enable us, as Micah puts it, to be, to truly love kindness, to care not at arm's length, as if the hurt might be contagious and we're going to catch it, not smothering either, as if to try to make up for things that we haven't done for a long time. Not full of guilt because of our neglect, but real, vital, truthful, and therefore much appreciated kindness. Would also help us provide ample space for others and to reserve judgment. Ooh, I suffer that one, I gotta tell you. What we read as discourtesy may be heartache too full for words. What we see as unconcerned may be protection for a heart that is already bursting with grief. And second, it's vital for us to remember God's MO in sending Jesus from heaven to earth. When God sought to demonstrate the depth of God's care and love for us to show how fully God identified with us. God became one of us. God inside of our skin. God is, Jesus is God incarnate. Incarnation in the flesh. Like us in every way except for sin. In his baptism, Jesus identified himself with our sinful nature. And on the cross, Jesus redeemed us. And even from the vantage points of the cross, Jesus could say, forgive them. They don't have a clue what they're doing. Stephen, one of the first seven deacons appointed by the apostles, was also the first Christian martyr. And while being stoned to death, feeling the rocks crushing out his life, he sees heaven opened up and Jesus standing at God's right hand and he says, Father, do not charge this sin against them. Which brings us full circle. Back to the beginning. God's forgiveness is not for decoration, but for use. And the question is, how are we using it? 
Each time we worship, we ask God to forgive us. We claim the promise, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And as we gather around this table today, we'll once again hear the promise, this new covenant that God is making with God's people is being sealed with the shedding of my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Take this, drink this, and remember me. And you can and should joy in that forgiveness and praise God for your new life. But what I also hear in those words from Jesus saying to me is, joy and praise is not enough, David. You cannot claim it for yourself unless you are willing to share it with others. In fact, if we don't share it, it's really not ours. Perhaps you've been carrying a burden of unforgiveness with you for months, years. However it happened, however terrible or cruel it may have been, if you cannot forgive the other, you cannot be freed. The poison will continue to flow through your life stream. Jesus wants us to know that there is serious business behind these words. Our own eternal welfare is at stake. But Jesus also wants us to know that he stands ready, willing, and able to empower us to forgive, to forget even, to find the release that only God's grace can supply and God's mercy procure for us. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. God's forgiveness is not for decoration. It's for use.